this is february march 2023 paper one uh, paper two two so we're going to start with the first question he says underline all the base units so ampere is a base unit and kelvin is for thermodynamic temperature the second equation uh, the second question states that this is an equation that is given to us so uh, i believe that v square equals to u square plus 2as is the equation that they rearranged to look like this one okay and uh, he's asking you that what are the two conditions in which this situation becomes this one so we can see that the initial velocity appears to be zero because that variable is missing which means that the initial velocity must have been zero so we have to explain the situation and we have mentioned that in the second point the initial speed is zero or the initial object or initially the object must be at rest the second condition or the first one is constant acceleration now notice that in this equation of motion and v equals to u plus a t and s equals to u t plus half a t square in all of these systems the acceleration the value of a is assumed to be constant only then these equations are valid right so next part states that uh, in part b using that equation we have these variables we have uh, to calculate the acceleration so acceleration let's make a the subject of the formula so this becomes a equals to v squared divided by 2 s so then it's just a matter of replacing the values so v is 2.75 and s is 3.89 so 2.75 whole square divided by 3.89 multiplied by 2 because of the formula so this value comes out as 0 0.972 so this is 972 up to two significant figures this becomes 97 the next part is determine the percentage uncertainty in two significant figures he's mentioned two significant so we have to be careful now the formula for acceleration because we have arranged the formula to look like this so the percentage uncertainty would the formula of percentage uncertainty would look something like this so delta a by a equals to two times delta v by v plus delta s by s but what he has done for us already is that he has given us the percentages or percentage uncertainties for both quantities so it's a matter of replacing all of them if this bracket was multiplied with 100 individually then we would be getting these percentages now we just have to replace because it has already been done for us we just have to replace the percentage values because this delta v by v multiplied by 100 is actually uh, 0 0.8 percent as mentioned in the question plus this delta s by s if individually multiplied by 100 has a value of 0 0.5 percent as mentioned in the questions values so this comes down to 2.1 percent now notice that where this two comes from if that is confusing for you don't worry Basically, this actually follows the power rule that whatever quantity has a power over itself, the power will be multiplied and then the delta x over x will be calculated. If let's say this was power of 3, then this would have been 3 delta x over x. If it had been under root x, then that would have been 1 over 2 delta x over x because under root 2 has a power of 1 over 2. So there is uh, this 2 coming from, right? So when you calculate this, this comes out as 2.1%. The next part is uh, calculate the absolute uncertainty now we have the value of a and we also have its percentage error in this situation right so so which means that if we have the value of a it would look something like this that it will be 0 0.97 plus minus 2.1 right so we have to calculate the absolute uncertainty so that will be delta a divided by a equals to 2.1 percent so let's take this a over there and the formula is going to look something so absolute uncertainty is equal to 0 0.97 which is the value of a being multiplied with 2.1 percent so 2.1 divided by 100 this gives us the value of 0 0.02037 so up to two significant sorry up to one significant figure because absolute uncertainties or errors are in one significant this will be 0 0.02 the next question deals with the power and energy so he says or uh, you can say kinematics as well so he says it is at x moves through y and then to z there is an electric motor connected over here there are some values of time and speed and it has a value of strain it has a value of Young's modulus and it values of weight the force on the string right assume that the weight of the wire is negligible okay fine calculate the cross-sectional area or a of the wire so first uh, write down the formula for young modulus which will be y is equal to stress over strain 
so young's modulus is equal to stress over strain and uh, the value of young's modulus is given to us as 2.2 so this will be 2.2 into 10 raised to power 11 equals to stress is force over area divided by strain itself is 0 0.012 all right so we want to find the cross-sectional area so by mathematics or you can say by algebra a is going to come down and that a will be taken over there and this young's modulus will be brought over here f is already given to us over here as 1.4 so i'm going to write this down as a single go so a is equal to force which is 1.4 into 10 raised to power 4 divided by 0 0.012 the strain into young's modulus which is 2.2 into 10 raised to power 11. when you calculate this this answer is going to come out as uh, 5.3 power minus 5 so this will be 5.3 into 10 raised to power minus 5 meter square the cross-sectional area the next part is about the increase in gravitational potential energy from x to y so while the block was here now the block is here so what's the change in height only then we can calculate the mgh so let's write down the formula so the gravitational potential energy to change in gravitational potential will be mgh now luckily the value of mg which is the weight of the object is already given to us as 1.4 power 4 so we don't have to convert this we can directly write down 1.4 power 4 but the value of h has to be calculated now how do you do that do we have some speed of the object and some time it took from x to y so we can simply use the formula of a speed equal to distance over time taking time over there this distance which becomes height equals to speed multiplied by time so that will be 0 0.64 multiplied by 0 0.49 so this height h will become 0 0.49 multiplied by 0 0.64 of course h will not be in this equation we have to replace it with the numerical values but i'm just writing this down for your understanding so after being multiplied this is going to this is going to become 4.39 into 10 raised to power 3 joules which up to two significant figures is 4.4 power 3. The next part is that the most motor has an efficiency of 56%. Uh, in these questions, I always advise my students to make this model, which helps you to understand it or visualize it more uh, easily. So this is my total input, and this is my useful output. Useful output would mean that uh, what the machine was designed to do. The machine was designed to carry it from low level to high level, right? And it is a 0.5. 56% efficient or 56% efficient this is what he is asking you to find out that how much input power do we need to give it so to calculate this first we need to calculate the useful output power but what job what task the machine has done for us since we are dealing with power we have to convert some energy or something into power so power is equal to energy divided by time do we have some energy that or do we have some work done that the machine has done for us yes the machine did gravitational potential energy or the machine has worked against the gravity and has invested 4.4 into power 3 into the block so that it can go up so the electric motor finally has invested 4.4 into 10 raised to power 3 joules of energy all of this was done in a time frame of 0 0.49 seconds as mentioned by the examiner right over here so 0 0.49 divided by 0 0.49 we can find the power of this uh, whole system which comes out as 8979.5 watts. I'm taking full values because I'm not uh, at the final answer. That's why I'm taking the full values. So this was my useful output. Whatever the machine was taking from the input, it has successfully converted that and given me back approximately 8900 watts of power or 9000 watts of power up to, two, up to one significant figure. Now I have to convert, now I have to find out how much did it take from the source, how much effort did it require from my source. So then we use the formula for efficiency that will be 56% equals to the useful output divided by the total input. Right? So the useful output is 897, 8979 and the efficiency is 56%. And what we're supposed to find out is in the denominator. So let's take this over there and exchange them. So my useful or the total input will become equal to 8979.5 divided by 0 0.56. We have to convert this percentage into a decimal value, right? So my total input power comes out as 160304 304 watts.
uh, 0 through 4 watts, right? This becomes 16,000 watts up to two significant figures. So we can write this down as 1.6 into 10 to the power 4 watts, all right? And it seems plausible. You can see that the if, if we assume this machine to be 50% efficient, just for the sake of argument, right? What would that mean? It would mean that if the machine has taken 1,000 watts from you, it will only give you back 500 watts of power to be used in a useful cause and it would be wasting 500 watts of power due to its inherent problem due to friction due to inefficiencies of the machine design right so if uh, this is 56 percent i should expect an answer that should be double this of my output so if you take this 9000 and we'll about this by two it should be 1800 or close to 18000 watts is our answer close to 18000 watts yes it is 16000 which means that our calculation was approximately right we don't have to recheck it again right so you can just do mental maths, just a bit of this to verify or to stop wasting your time in, te uh, in terms of rechecking your paper. The base of the block is now at uniform deceleration of magnitude of this value from level Y to Z. Calculate the tension in the wire as the block moves from Y to Z. Now the block has to move from Y to Z and it experiences deceleration. While it was moving from X to Y, it was moving at a constant speed as mentioned over here. It was moving at a constant speed, but now it's not. It has to stop. So let's draw a free body diagram of the whole system. So this is our tension that is carrying the block upwards. Uh, this is the weight mg, and the whole system experiences a resultant force fr equals to ma. Now, if we were to draw or if we were to write down an equation for this, this would look like T minus mg equals to ma. Okay, fine, no problem in that. But there is one thing that we need to understand it is decelerating. The object is decelerating. So on the resultant side, we should add a negative sign with the acceleration. So the equation is going to look like as T minus mg equals to minus ma. Because whatever happens or whatever is happening between them, it is leading to a negative answer. It is causing the object to slow down, right? So the result of T minus mg should be a negative value. So then the equation or the whole system becomes simple. This T is what we want to find out. Taking mg over there, this becomes positive. So it will be mg minus ma. So now we understand where the equation comes from. We just have to plug in the value. So t equals to mg, which is already the weight, 1.4 power 4, minus mass, which is 1.4 into 10 to the power 4, divided by 9.81, multiplied by acceleration, which is 1.3, given by the examiner. Now this mass is calculated by w equals to mg. This is what we want to find out. w is given to you, 1.4 power 4, g taken to the other side gets divided that's why mass is represented like this once you finally calculate this your answers are going to be 1.4 into 10 is to power 4 minus 8 18 double 5 now when you su finally subtract this and convert this to two significant figures this becomes 1.2 into 10 is to power 4 newtons right uh, the next part is uh, about the distance now first or foremost my recommendation to students is to figure out what the gradient represents. So the gradient of this graph represents what? It represents speed, right? So then it becomes easy to figure out how to visualize the line. So from X to Y, the speed, let's talk about the speed. The speed was constant. If the speed was constant, then the gradient should be constant. It cannot be zero. It should be a constant positive value. So up to, let's say, Tx, our object, as a, a positive gradient right and if we are at tx we consider the distance to be zero so it has to start from the origin so the line goes in a straight line of course i'm drawing this with freehand it may not appear to be as straight as it should be but you're going to use a ruler to draw this line so this will be a straight line and from ty to tz we realize that it was a decelerating if it is decelerating then the gradient should also be decreasing and if it slows down while reaching tz the gradient should become zero because it's going to come to a stop. If the gradient becomes, or if we can say, if this, if it comes to a stop, the speed becomes zero. So the gradient should also become zero and the line should look like a straight line horizontally. So from this point onwards, from uh, TY onwards, we see a fall in gradient or a decrease in gradient. So from this section to this section, we can see that the gradient reduces. And from this section to this section, we can see that the gradient becomes zero and the object slows down to a complete halt. Right? And of course, there could be some variation. You could have drawn it in this way, that with a larger curve and with a smaller section in which it stops. It's fine. It doesn't matter. 
Okay. As long as you're following the idea what's happening between the two sections. Question number three is from principle of moments. He has given you the whole situation. We will have a horizontal component. We will have a vertical component. Horizontal components don't much in, get involved in such, uh, such scenarios because we have vertical components to cause the moment. So weight will cause a moment clockwise. W12 is going to cause a moment clockwise. But uh, this vertical component of the 70 newtons is going to cause a moment anti-clockwise. So that is going to come down to uh, this idea and we can use this to find or to calculate what this unknown W may be. Again, this is just an anticipation before starting the question. Let's read the question. So he says that the beam is held horizontally and is in equilibrium. This is a good word. This is a good idea because that means that there are no forward and backward movements. There is no upwards and downwards movement and the resultant torque is also equal to zero. So this is a common question he's going to ask you again and again. He says, what is the meaning of equilibrium? What are the two conditions? It, it is always going to be this answer. The resultant force in any direction is zero. What does that mean? It means that the rod itself is neither moving forward, is neither moving backward, it's neither going up or down. It is held completely stationary in this condition. Now, if you go to kinematics, this resultant force being equal to zero means that there is no acceleration. But in this scenario, in this chapter, or in this question, we narrow it down to this one idea that there is no up, down, left, or right movement. Okay? The second idea is about torque. Torque will also be zero, or the resultant torque will be zero, which means that there, in, in simple man terms, it means that there is no rotation. Right? Now, what does that look like? It means that neither the rod is going to rotate like this, nor the rod is going to rotate like this. That's it. Simple as that. This idea that it is in equilibrium gives us the confidence that now we can use that all the sum of clockwise and all the sum of anti-clockwise moments are actually equal. If they hadn't been equal, then this would be rotating, right? So these two ideas are, an, uh, you can say, an extension of the equilibrium. When you see this word equilibrium, this will always the, mean these two things. I will recommend you memorize these answers. They're going to, this is a repeated question, gets asked again and again. Show that the vertical component of the tension is this. Now, in the show that questions, if you are unable to show this value, does that mean that you can leave the rest of the question? No. Show that means that do you understand that how to solve this part? And if you're unable to do so, please consider that the vertical component is 30 newtons. So please solve the rest of the parts and rest of the questions using this value that the examiner has given to you himself, right? So let's find out that can we solve this horizontal component? Can we find it out? But let me clear out this whole uh, situation so that we can write down our own words over here. Now, the horizontal component, the horizontal component, although not required at this stage, is going to be, since it is close to the angle, this will become the force, 17. Since it's the base, it becomes cos of the angle, which is 50. Right? Uh, and if you calculate this, this is going to come out as 9.2 probably. Let me see. No, no, this is not my point two. This is going to come out as, let's calculate this. So 17 cos 50 becomes 10.92. This is 10.92. I'm going to take it as 11 newtons. Again, I repeat, it's not participating right now, but I'm just calculating for the sake of understanding. And then we have a vertical component acting at this point due to 17 newtons, so this is going to become 17 sine of 50. A small shortcut is that anyone or any component in front of the angle has a sine, and anything touching the angle or close to the angle and hypotenuse is a cos. You can use trigonometric ratios to uh, do this as well. I have no compulsion towards that. I'm just recommending a shortcut. So this 17 sine 50 becomes 13.0. So this is 13.0 newton. This is what you wanted to no, that do you understand how to calculate this? So just show the equation, which will be 17 sine of 50, and you will find out 13 newtons. That's your answer. That is it. Simple. In C part, again, he comes down to taking moments about A and then find the value of W. Easy. As I've discussed before, the orange components are trying to cause a clockwise moment. So they will be added together. They are helping each other. And opposed by a component of the 17 newton, which is trying to hold it down, which is trying to stop this rod from moving clockwise. And only this component is responsible for this. This horizontal component is not doing anything in this rotation. So, then we have, uh, simply by taking moments, that will be W 
into 0 0.25. Now notice that uh, this uh, distance from this point to this point I have taken to be 0 0.25, right? Uh, it is the total distance is 0 0.35 plus 0 0.15, so that becomes 0 0.5. So this rest of the distance will be 0 0.25 again. So taking this at the center because the weight because it's a uniform beam, the weight will be at the center. Okay, that is the idea behind it. So added with uh, another force of 12 newtons at a distance of 0 0.35 from the pivot. All the distances are taken from A pivot. So this is 0 0.35 as given over here is equal to or is it balanced by this component which is 30 newtons acting at this location anti-clockwise and from the pivot up to this point it has a total distance of 0 0.5 because I've added 0 0.35 and 0 0.15. So this becomes uh, 13 multiplied by 0 0.5. You have to find W. So after performing algebra, you can straight away write down your answer as 9.2 Newton. So this becomes 9.2. So the value of W should be 9.2. Calculate the magnitude of the vertical component, vertical component of the force exerted on the beam. Now this is a good question in terms of repetition. This is a rare question, but is he bluntly or he, you can uh, you can say out of the blue, he will ask you this question. Now how to visualize what he's asking you. He's asking you that if this is the rod, what are all the forces acting on it in the vertical direction? So this is our hinge, let's say at point A. This is our weight, which we calculated as 9.2. This is our force of 12 Newtons acting downwards. And what was the upward force at this location? This was 13 Newtons. Now, if the whole rod is in equilibrium, right? So there should be the upward forces should be balanced by the downward forces. So adding these two forces together, should be equal to all the upward forces now we have only one point of contact at the rod extreme that is this point which was acting at an angle and the other point of contact is at the hinge so there should be another force acting upwards or you can say that the whole rod seems to be balanced on two pylons that are supporting its weight that are supporting the weight and the 12 newton component so what is the force coming from the hinge right so simply put you add all the downward forces together, subtract it from the upward forces, and you will find out the unbalancing force that will be provided by the hinge to support this in the vertical direction. So adding them together, so 9.2 plus 12, all the downward forces minus all the upward forces, 13, balances out or equals out to 8. Point Let me do this again. So this will be 12 plus 9.2 minus 13 this comes out as 8.2 yes so this is 8.2 newtons right so this is 8.2 newtons in the upwards direction on the hinge now it says that the block is now moved closer to a if the block was let's say at this original location now the block is being moved closer to the position of a which means that the block will be moved from this location and brought here let's say it is at this point now okay he is asking you what's going to happen to the horizontal component now this is very strange we didn't talk about the horizontal component we were only dealing with vertical components previously now how to visualize this now notice that if we draw the horizontal component which was trying to pull this whole rod outwards on the hinge it is connected it is connected over here right the rod is trying to, or it, you can say it is being stretched by this force in this direction with a force of 11 newtons. If you remember, we have already calculated this component over here. So it is being pulled out by 11 newtons. But is the rod moving towards the right side? No, it's not, which means that according to Newton's third law, the hinge must also be providing a force of 11 newtons to the left because it's not moving, right? And if you move the rod closer to the position of A, what's going to happen to this value? Notice that uh, if you move the rod closer to the hinge, the moment or the clockwise moment, this whole component reduces. Why? Because F into D or the distance from this point to this point, this is F into D. If D decreases, if distance from the pivot decreases, the whole moment decreases. That means that the combined effort of W and the 12 Newton component is going to get reduced. Now, if that reduces, the stress on this wire also reduces, which means that the upward component, which was T sine of 50, 
the value of T or the tension decreases, it wouldn't have to carry as much as load as it was carrying before, right? So if T decreases, then we have the component, horizontal component was T cos 50. If T is decreasing, then this T cos 50, the horizontal component also decreases. And if the horizontal component, which is trying to pull it out, decreases, according to Newton's third law, the effort that has to be made by hinge A in order to hold it in place and not let it slide left or right would also start decreasing. It wouldn't have to apply such a force to keep it in place or to pull it apart, right? Uh, another example of this would be, let's say that if there is a wall and you have a rope hooked to the wall, if you start pulling the force with 100 newtons, the wall will pull back with 100 newtons and will not let you budge. But if you decrease the force, let's say, if you reduce the force by 30 newtons, the wall will now be exerting a force of 30 newtons. That's all the amount of force it needs to stop you from moving. The same thing is happening over here. Since the horizontal component decreases, because the vertical component decreases, because of the reduced moment, we can say that the force provided by the hinge will also decrease in the horizontal direction. So that's why you will see this answer to be decreases. I understand that this is a one mark question, but this is a good question in terms of concept. That's why I've taken a lot of time on this part. Okay. I hope that we understand this. The, the answer decreases in the marking scheme and in the examiner report does not explain anything. But there is a very big reason mathematics involved in this. Okay. So I hope that we understand this. The next question is uh, from Momentum. Uh, momentums before collision, after collision are given to you. Uh, he says, and luckily the directions are also given, so the rightward directions are positive, leftwards are negative directions of momentum. Uh, he has explained the whole scenario over here, right? He says block X has initial energy, kinetic energy of this one, character the mass of the block. So we have uh, the formula for momentum equals to mb, and the formula for kinetic energy is half mv squared. So we can say that half mv squared is equal to 0 0.30. Very simply put, because uh, the equations are equal. And to find the mass, we need mass to be, to be the subject of the formula. So, rho divided by m equals to v will be the subject. Let's rearrange this. Now, let's replace uh, this equation in place of v. We will get 1 over 2 m into rho square divided by m square equal to 0 0.30. Right? So, m cancels out with this m. We have the momentum, we want to find m, let's take m over there and bring 0 0.3 over here. So this becomes 1 over 2 into momentum square, which is 0 0.37 square, whole divided by 0 0.30 equals to m. So when you find m, this comes out as 0 0.23 kg. So this will be 0 0.23. The next question is, determine the magnitude of the momentum of block y after the collision. Very straightforward question. He's asking you about the momentum of y. The direction is already given. So let's add all of these things. So momentum before or the change in momentum before the collision equals to change in momentum after the collision. So since block x is moving towards the right side, it will be plus 0 0.37 plus minus 0 0.65 because that block y was moving towards the left. So it, it has to be a negative sign. Now notice that I've added a plus sign right why because we're looking for the total momentum now when you say total in english that means you have to add them together and the reason i'm adding positive and negative signs is for you to understand that the direction matters you could have directly, directly written down as 0 0.37 minus 0 0.65 it would have been perfectly all right but i'm adding this information for those people or for those students who don't understand this and then after the collision we understand that x was moving towards the left side this will become 0 0.13 again with a plus sign plus y was moving towards the left side so negative momentum of y then you rearrange this in terms of algebra so the momentum of y comes out as uh, 0 0.15 0 0.15 okay block x exerts an average force of 7.7 uh, .7 on y during the collision he says find the time taken for the process now since block y is being referred to so we will only look at block y so the value or the formula for force or comes from impulse which is delta p change in momentum divided by time now the force is mentioned which is 7.7 .7, equals to change in momentum what was that let's discuss that later and this is the time t that we want to find out what was the change in momentum previously the block y was moving towards the left 0 0.65 and now the block is still moving towards the left with 0 0.15 so that since the direction is same then the change will look something like this 0 0.65 minus simply 0 0.15 
right? Let me write, rewrite this down. So this will be 0 0.65 minus 0 0.15. Then you take T over there and 7.7 uh, .7 over here. So T becomes, uh, please don't forget to take the subtraction first or use the fraction to calculate this. This comes out as 0 0.0649. So, to, sig uh, to significant, this will be 0 0.65. Question number 5 is from CRO and graphical calculations, wave intensity and so on. The frequency is given to us, uh, CRO is displayed, and he has mentioned that these locations are 1 centimeter locations. These are 1 centimeter. He says determine the time base seconds in seconds per centimeter. No problem. First, figure out the time period. So, time period will be 1 over F, which will be 1 over 5000. So, time period comes out as 0 0.2 milliseconds. Okay, 0 0.2 power minus 3. And the whole wave is being represented in a time frame of 6 boxes. You can count this. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the whole graph is represented in a matter of 6 centimeters. You can also operate with the opposite logic that the whole wave is, or a one complete wave is being represented in 4 boxes. That is also fine. It does not matter. But I like to take the whole wave for any small box conf conflicts that may arise. So in six centimeters, we have represented approximately 1.5 wavelengths, right? So if this is 1.5, that means that the time for one wave is 0 0.2 millisecond, then the rest of the wave should be 0 0.1 milliseconds. So total time, which is, uh, or the total frequency, which is 0 0.3 milliseconds of the whole screen being divided at uh, six centimeters. Now, please be advised, Open this uh, millisecond up. So this will be 0 0.3 into 10 raised to power minus 3 divided by 6. This leads to 5 or 50 into 10 raised to power minus 6 seconds per centimeter. You can write this down as 5 into 10 raised to power minus 5 or this one. It does not matter. What does that mean? It means that this 1 by 1 centimeter box along the x axis has a time base setting of 5 or 50 microseconds. Only then the wave of 5000 frequency can be represented on the screen like this. I'm going to erase this so that we can draw for the second part. Okay. All right. So uh, the second part says draw on the or sketch on the graph of the new wave intensity of 3i. Now there is a relationship between them and the relationship is that intensity is proportional to amplitude square now the good thing about this relationship is that if you want to compare two waves or compare two scenarios together you can simply write the, this equation down in terms of division so let's say that the intensity of the second wave divided by intensity of the first wave is now going to be equal to so we get rid of the proportionality sign you're going to be equal to the amplitude of the second wave divided by amplitude of the first wave and there is a square over them square square now, what is the amplitude of the first wave? This is luckily one centimeter. So this value is going to become one square, which will be taken to the other side so that it actually completely vanishes. It does not participate in the system. So we can understand that uh, both intensities are actually a uh, multiple of i. So I can replace them as instead of i2 and i1, I can write down that this is 3i divided by i equals to a2 whole square right because this one was already tackled with right uh, i cancels out right so we are left with a2 square equals to 3 so take you under root over there this becomes under root 3 which is 1.72 okay so we can't draw of course the third decimal uh, the third significant figure so we are going to zoom in for the sake of uh, this question only and count the number of boxes properly so that you can observe now notice that uh, one box is of one centimeters okay so if this is one centimeter this is one centimeter so let's label this as one this will be two and this will be three so we have to go up to a decimal or 1.7 amplitude so this will be one this is two so 1.2 1.4 1.6 1.8 and 2 so it should be between 1.6 and 1.8 so that would be a line that is at this point so what I generally do, I draw a dotted line with a lead pencil very lightly over to the upper limit so that I don't exceed it and to the lower limit. So again, uh, keeping in mind that we don't have to exceed the 1.7. I would advise you since the question is for three marks, please show the working that I've done over here and over here so the examiner knows what you've done. 
right and since there are no changes in the frequency or the amplitude or sorry the frequency of the time period that means that it will still be crossing at these locations the shape of the wave will remain same except the amplitude so combining the negative amplitude of 1.7 then crossing this point with 1.7 and so on and so forth this will be your final answer okay all right so we move on to the next part it's a diffraction grading question uh, wavelength is given uh, the slit separation is given the d is not mentioned right now let's see if it's mentioned in the next part he he tells you that uh, okay so this is our a no this is x so this is fringe separation so in the formula for ax equals to lambda d this is our x this is our a this is our lambda so naturally he's going to ask me about d but let's see what the first question is explain why bright fringe bright fringe is produced at point p the you see point p is exactly at the center and we understand that the two waves coming from both ends actually meet at this point to create the central bright fringe if the fringe is bright then it will be constructive interference so that is what we have to represent that is what we talk about why is there a bright fringe at the center so luckily or you can say fortunately the path difference is zero the phase difference is zero that's a special case for the center case only right hence due to the constructive interference bright fringe is formed at the center now notice that if you were looking or if you were going to find another bright fringe at the upper location or at the lower location what would have been the path difference or phase difference in those situations let's consider that all right so one wave coming from this point and one wave coming from this point the first bright fringe after the central bright fringe the path difference is actually one lambda and the phase difference is now 360 degrees or two pi right and if you are at uh, some location at the center which is the dark fringe at that location the path difference would have been 0 0.5 lambda and a phase difference of 180 degrees okay right so he says calculate the distance d so ax equals to lambda d uh, this becomes the value of uh, simply putting the value of a <coughs> that would be 3.6 into 10 raised to power minus 4 into 4 into 10 raised to power minus 3 equals to lambda 630 into 10 raised to power minus 9 into the value of d so d calculated properly is going to be 2.28 which becomes 2.3 then we have uh, on figure 5.3 sketch and please notice what he is asking you to be constant or telling you that these things will be constant he says distance d and the separation of the two slits are unchanged which means that the thing that we are going to compare is fringe separation and lambda so ax equals to lambda d what is constant he said that i am not changing the value of d d gets cancelled out and the next thing <coughs> that he says is going to be constant is a uh, the slit separation is not changing so we are left with x being proportional to lambda right so as lambda increases x should also increase so it should go, it's going to be a, an upward sloping line but how do we start it is it going to start from the origin no it can't start from the origin why because if we put in the values into ax equals to lambda d even if you put lambda as 400 there is no way that the value of x is going to become zero right all of them have a numerical value so it can't start from the region it's going to start from a non-zero value at 400 but as you go away or as you move uh, or as you increase the value of lambda from 400 to 700 the value of spring separation should also increase so it's going to, going to be an upward sloping line like this it could be anything it could be any straight line does not matter since it's a one mark question it's a sketch question Question number six says define potential difference again a generic definition it's the energy transferred from electrical to other forms that is v equals to work done by charge and potential difference especially is across the components let's say resistor fan bulb mobile phone laptop charger so that electrical energy is being converted into other formats no doubt so joules per coulomb so energy converted by each charge into other formats this is the diode uh, graph we understand this from memory as well he says use figure 6.1 to describe qualitatively uh, in terms of words only you don't need to show calculations if we wanted calculations he would have said 
quantitatively. So this is the resistance between 0 to 0 0.25. If you zoom in, this is the 0 0.25 point and this is 0 0.75. At this location, we can see that the voltage exists. We are applying the voltage, but there is no flow of current. So what can we say about such a component? So the resistance in this range is very high or almost infinite. It appears to be infinite resistance that we are applying voltage and it is disobeying Ohm's law, which is voltage applied gives you current. So then we have the variation, if any, in resistance from 0 0.75 to 1.0. Now, from this region to this region, we can see that the gradient keeps on increasing, which means that over here in this region, the resistance is decreasing as voltage is increasing. Again, typical of uh, the diode to behave like this. In part C, we have a question in terms of wires. He says that we have a 12 volt battery internal negligible internal resistance. We have a combination of wire and a branch of resistors. The first part he asks you is the current in the resistor wire. Now, according to Kirchhoff's first law, current entering a junction, which is 2.7, should be the current equal to leaving the junction. Now, we know that 1.5 amperes of traffic was diverted into this part. Then where is the rest of the current going to go? So, this will be 2.7 minus 1.5, which will be 1.2 amperes of current in this branch. So, simply put, 2.7 minus 1.5, please show your working. This will become 1.2 amperes in this branch. He says, determine the resistance of the variable resistor. No problem in that. Uh, we understand that if we simply erase the rest of the circuit to make it look easy or to at least understand it better, we understand that the whole circuit is in parallel combination, right? So, let's remove the rest of the circuit so that it becomes easy to visualize. Now, if you notice that if we look at it this way, we can see that the battery of 12 volts is acting or is providing voltage across to this combination or to this, or to this branch of 5 ohms and variable resistor. Do we know how much current is going through the resistor or through this branch? Yes, it is 1.5. The same 1.5 is also going through this branch or through this resistor as well. So, according to the parallel rules, we have V equals to IR. The voltage is 12 volt. The current is 0 0.12. Uh, sorry. That is 1.5. And the resistance of the whole branch is 5 plus R. Right? Because the battery does not know how much resistance is over here. Is it separately connected or is it connected as a lump? So, considering them to be lump resistances, together right uh, take 1.5 over there divide this so r will be and then 5 over there will be subtraction so r becomes 3 ohms which will become 3.0 ohms so we can simply write down 3 ohms over there for future references so i'm going to erase this and bring back the circuit again for future references so this is going to become 3. Point or 3.0 ohms so we've done this successfully now the next part says the wire xy has this and the whole situation is explained to you determine the potential difference between w and z what does that mean? What does the question suggest? It suggests that if I were to connect a voltmeter between these two points like this, what will be the value on the voltmeter? There are two ways to do this. The first way, again, you choose how you want to do this, would be to find out the voltages of all the sections. What is the voltage over here? What is the voltage over here? Then take the difference of both of them, then you can find out the value of V. Or the other uh, format could be, find out the value of this section and find out the value of this section then take the difference of them then you will also get the value of v it's your choice how you want to visualize it i will show you all the methods and then you can see uh, or you can choose what method you're comfortable with but we need to understand where this voltage is being measured from, right okay so for this section i realized that this is actually 1.6 centimeters away from the main point so this 12 volt is being equally divided on this whole wire because it's a wire of uniform length and uniform resistance, right? So, how much voltage does this section consume as compared to the full wire? So, by ratio method, I want to find out. So, this will become this length of the wire is 0 0.4 meters. So, 0 0.4 meters of wire compared with the whole wire, which is 2 meters, multiplied by the 12 voltage which is being shared amongst them. So, this comes out as 2.4 volts. So, and also notice that uh, when the current enters this branch, this node has a voltage of 12 volts. This node has a voltage of 12 volts. And when it leaves, 
it has a voltage of zero volt it has a voltage of zero volts the electron is completely drained of its energy all right okay the next part is to calculate the voltage consumed by this resistor no issues at all you see since they are connected in parallel the voltage will be the same and the we know that it has a resistance of 3 ohms so using the potential divider rule this will be 3 divided by 3 plus 5 into the 12 volt that are being supplied so this comes out as a 4.5 volts so this section is consuming approximately 4.5 volts and the upper section is consuming 2.4 volts now since we have both voltages or both potentials in comparison to zero in comparison to the ground voltage I can simply so that Z has a voltage of 2.4 and W has a voltage of 4.5 as compared to the zero volt point if let's say you were to connect a voltmeter at this location it would give you an answer of 2.4 if you were to connect a voltmeter over here it would give you an answer of 4.5 okay fine though those two points are at zero volt so they don't matter so we're just going to subtract 2.4 with 4.5 it will give us an answer of 2.1 right but now let's look at from the if you want to subtract we can do this so this will be 4.5 minus 2.4 this gives you 2.1 volts now let's uh, appear uh, let's attempt this from the other side so let's say that this is the voltage of this section so how do you calculate this 1.6 meters length of wire divided by 2 the complete wire the ratio multiplied by the 12 volts that are being divided this gives me an answer of 9.6 volts so this section is consuming 9.6 volts starts with 12 loses 9.6 and at this location it only has 2.4 in comparison to zero the second uh, section would be calculated similarly that if this section is consuming 4.5 then the rest of the voltage is going to go to this one but no applying a voltage divider rule so 5 divided by 8 which comes from 3 plus 5 the total resistance of the whole branch multiplied by 12 volts which are being shared by being divided amongst them so this comes out as 7.5 volts again if you take a difference of 9.6 with a 7.5 you will get 2.1 so either you solve it from the left side the green side or the right side the red side it does not matter your answer will come out as 2.1 as explained from the marking scheme i've taken both of them you can compare them right so that does not matter so this is 2.1 volts all right uh, and uh, if you want to decipher the statement he says potential difference between w and z that would mean that the voltage of W will be subtracted from W from Z. Or you can say that uh, the voltage of uh, this W point, the W point will have the higher precedence for both subtractions, either 7.5 minus, uh, minus uh, uh, 9.6 or the other way around. Okay. All right. So then we have the fourth part. He says that the current in the resistor is now decreased. So this variable resistor's resistance is being decreased this is being decreased it is being decreased oh, no sorry it is being increased this resistance is being increased if the resistance increase the current in this branch that was 1.5 should it should it increase or decrease we can calculate this the voltage is 12 12 volts so 12 divided by 5 plus r equals to the current if you increase the value of r the whole bracket gives you a smaller value of current are we changing the circumstances of the wire no we are not are we changing the voltage of the supply we are not so 1.2 ampere through the wire is unchanged so we write down that the current through the wire remains unchanged so its power remains unchanged the second point is made that the current through the variable resistor branch decreases why because if you increase the resistance of one component the whole current or the whole branch suffers and will receive lesser current now when that current decreases since this 2.7 amperes is coming from the battery 1.2 amperes is still fixed of the wire but now the current of the other branch which was 1.5 is going to get reduced so we are adding 1.5 equal to the battery current right now if you decrease 1.5 the battery current which was the sum of both of them will also decrease that is why we've written down that a total current from the battery decreases if the current decreases through the battery then the total power developed according to p equals to ie which comes from p equals to iv also decreases so the battery produces less power also notice that if i mention p equals to ie i put a bracket and mention what every letter represents this is absolutely necessary because the examiner does not know although he knows but he needs to know that can you explain your formulas that you've written down add a bracket and please explain what each variable does so that is the answer for this question
Then we have question number seven. He says x and y are isotopes. Uh, x is unstable, so it emits a beta emission and makes z with this equation zero plus one. So this is going to be a a z and z minus one. Okay. Uh, he says by comparing the number of protons, nucleus X with Y. Now since X and Y are isotopes of the same element, they will have the same number of protons, so the charges on both of them will be the same. X compared with Z, so X compared with Z, what would this look like? So Z has one less charge because of the beta emission, so X will have one higher charge than Z due to the X or due to X going undergoing beta positive decay. One less charge will be observed. You can write this in any order of English. Then we have hadron have uh, two classes. Yes, uh, the first one is barons with uh, three quarks and protons and neutrons belong to this family. And the other family is mesons. They have two quarks. One is a quark and one is an anti-quark itself. So this question is purely from memory, right?